The first speaker is Dr. Sunil Rao, and the title is Optimal Anticoagulation During PCI. Great, thanks very much, and thanks for coming to this session. Um, I don't know if my disclosure slide uh, didn't show, I guess, but unfortunately, they haven't changed since yesterday. Uh, so um, let's talk a little bit about anticoagulation during PCI, and I think this talk will largely be reviewed for many of you because the golden era of antithrombotic trials was really during the 2000s. And you know, over 100,000 patients randomized in studies to different anticoagulation strategies. And no talk on antithrombotic therapy would be complete without showing you at least one slide of the coagulation cascade. Um, and I, you know, this is a very simplified version of the coagulation cascade. I think what all of us learned in medical school has completely changed. But what I want to point out to you is a few things about antithrombin therapy, because that's what we're going to talk about during this talk. We're not talking about antiplatelet therapy, but antithrombin therapy. And the different sites of action are shown for you on this particular slide. Uh, and the agents of, for consideration that have been studied in the large trials are fondaparinux, uh, heparin or anoxaparin, uh, and bivalirudin. And it's important to understand where they act uh, in sites um, in the coagulation cascade because that ultimately determines the efficacy or the safety of the drugs in the cath lab, which is what we're interested in. And obviously, the importance of antithrombin therapy uh, with relative to antiplatelet therapy is really based on the inhibition of thrombin, which is a very, very potent potentiator of platelet function. So these two things work hand in hand, uh, anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy. Um, and the reason that we need to worry about this is that what's happening in the cath lab is iatrogenic plaque rupture. So when you blow the balloon up and you crack the plaque, uh, there's thrombin generation, platelet activation, vessel wall injury, and inflammation. The vessel wall injury and inflammation we treat with metal, with a stent. Platelet activation, obviously, is with P2Y12 inhibitors. Remember that P2Y12 inhibitors are inhibitors of platelet activation. 2B3A inhibitors are inhibitors of platelet aggregation. Uh, and then there's thrombin generation. And so we use combination therapy in the cath lab. The question is, which one should we use? And that's really dependent on what our goals are in the cath lab. Our goals are primarily to make sure that the patient has a good clinical outcome. But what does that really mean? It means that we want to avoid catheter thrombus. We want to make sure that the equipment that's inside the, uh, the patient's body doesn't develop thrombus on it, because that obviously can lead to uh, thrombotic emboli. We want to minimize or hopefully eliminate ischemic sequelae. So atherothrombotic emboli, large periprocedural MIs, stent thrombosis, side branch occlusions, and then we want to minimize bleeding risk. And the importance of these goals uh, also make us think about the different patient subsets that we are going to treat in the cath lab. And there may be slightly different other <laughs> pragmatic goals. So for example, if you're doing a CTO, you want to make sure that you have an agent that's reversible because perforation risk may be a little bit higher than with non-CTOs. If you're doing multi-vessel PCI or complex PCI where you're in the lab for quite a while, you want to have consistency of that antithrombotic effect. Uh, and you don't want to have, end up in a situation where uh, you start getting interprocedural thrombus because the agent that you used initially hasn't been redosed or the effect has worn, has worn off. To add even a more complicating dimension to all of this is that the safety of these agents is also influenced by other concomitant strategies, antiplatelet therapy, for example, and importantly, access site. So um, we're going to talk, we're here to talk about radial versus femoral a little bit later on, but uh, does access site influence the safety or efficacy of the antithrombin agent uh, that you're using? And that has been the, the subject of large randomized trials. And another trial that's going to be presented, uh, I believe, at ESC from the Swedish registry, a uh, very, very large study randomizing bivalirudin versus heparin, uh, where the predominant access site strategy is radial approach. Now, I want to emphasize again, and this is something that we uh, talk about in the cath lab, in our cath lab when we're teaching fellows, is the sites of action for anticoagulants. Um, and what I ask the fellows is, what is ACT? And the answer that I get is activated clotting time. And I say, no, duh, but what is ACT? And what ACT measures is a reflection of antithrombin therapy. So it's the antithrombin effect that's reflected by ACT. So that helps us explain the ACT values that we get. So on one end of the spectrum is bivalirudin, which is a direct thrombin inhibitor. So think about the ACT values that you get with bivalirudin. They're very, very high. I was a fellow when we were doing Replace 2, and the first patient that we randomized, we gave bivalirudin to, and the ACT we got back was 400, and everybody freaked out. Until we realized that's the way the drug works. It's directly inhibiting thrombin. The half-life's 25 minutes, so it goes away in two hours when you tried it off. On the other end of the spectrum is the pure 10A inhibitor, fondaparinux. 
So if you're using Fonda Paranex in the cath lab, which you shouldn't do, and I'll talk about that in just a second, um, what do you think the ACT is? It's normal. It actually doesn't influence ACT at all because it doesn't have any direct two-way activity. Enoxaparin is a very interesting drug because when given sub-Q for ACS, for example, the 10A to 2A ratio is around 12 to 1. So you don't get much of a bump in ACT. However, when you use it IV, and we'll talk about the two IV enoxaparin trials, uh, it actually has a, a, a ratio of 4 to 1. So you can get a bump in your ACT with IV and oxaparin. It's usually around 200 seconds. And then in the middle is unfractionated heparin, which is, it has about a 1 to 1, 10A to 2A ratio. So keep that in mind. And the other thing that's important to keep in mind is that you have to have some direct 2A activity to prevent catheter thrombus. And we're not going to talk about fondaparinox in this talk because it has no role by itself in the cath lab. And the reason is that it's, a, it's an indirect 10A inhibitor, has no direct 2A activity. So in the OASIS 5 and 6 trials, what we saw was an increased rate of catheter thrombosis necessitating the addition of either heparin or bivalirudin to prevent catheter thrombus. It was actually a protocol amendment. So the agents that we're going to consider for this talk are going to be enoxaparin, unfractionated heparin, and bivalirudin. So let's talk a little bit about unfractionated heparin. This is the only trial of unfractionated heparin dosing ever done in the modern era. This is the Futura OASIS-8 study. This was done, the motivation for this trial was really based on the results of OASIS 5 and 6, which are the Fondaparinux ACS trials. Remember what I just told you, Fondaparinux um, in those trials uh, was associated with an increased risk of catheter thrombosis. So the idea was, what is the dose of heparin that's necessary if you're going to have a patient that comes to the cath lab on a background of Fondaparinux therapy? So this is a randomized study with standard dose heparin. 85 units per kilo or 60 units per kilo if you're going to use a 2B3 inhibitor, and it's ACT-guided, so guideline-based therapy. The other randomized arm was low-dose unfractionated heparin. So you just gave 50 units per kilo, forget about the ACT, because the idea was, well, if you're going to have some 10A activity, maybe that inhibits 2A a little bit, so you just need a little bit of heparin to, uh, to prevent catheter thrombosis. And the primary endpoint here was safety, which was bleeding. Um, and you can see that the, uh, the, the primary outcome of 48 hours, which is peri-PCI major minor bleeds and vascular complications, was not different between the two arms. Um, and you can see that there was no significant difference in major bleeding or major uh, vascular access site complications. Keep in mind, it was about 70% radial access in this trial. Um, and minor bleeds were slightly increased with the higher dose heparin arm. But what's interesting about this is this. The death MI and TVR rate at 30 days was lower with the higher heparin dose. Okay, so that's very important. I think we all were indoctrinated in the golden era of 2B3 inhibitors that it was the heparin that was causing the bleeding, and we should really reduce our heparin dosing. It turns out that reducing your heparin dosing actually has a downside, and the downside is an increased risk of ischemic sequelae. So in order to reduce that risk, higher dose heparin is what's needed. And in this trial, higher dose heparin was ACT-guided heparin, 250 to 300 seconds if you're using a 2B3 inhibitor, 300 seconds or higher if you're not using a 2B3 inhibitor. So no difference in safety, some better efficacy with standard dose heparin. Um, now let's talk about IV and oxaparin. This is a strategy that's very, very popular in France. The first elective PCI trial done, uh, sort of a large trial done with IV and oxaparin strategy was the Steeple trial, 3,000 patients randomized and stratified by 2B3 inhibitor use, which, again, in the modern era, we're not using a lot of 2B3 inhibitors for elective PCI, but at the time that this trial was done, it was still in vogue. Randomized to weight-adjusted unfractionated heparin versus two different IV doses, 0.75 milligrams per kilogram IV or 0.5 milligrams per kilogram IV in oxaparin, and it's a trial driven by safety, so non-cabbage-related major bleeding at 30 days. Um, why would you want to use IV and oxaparin? Well, when you give it IV, it has a very, very short half-life. As I mentioned, the 10 a to 2A ratio is 4 to 1, so you can get a little bit of a bump in your ACT. And um, this trial, the Steeple trial, showed that there was less bleeding with IV and oxaparin compared with unfractionated heparin. But there was a wrinkle in this study that I think limited its adoption. The DSMB for this trial stopped the low-dose anoxaparin arm early because of an increased risk of, of uh, thrombotic complications. So they never completed enrollment in that trial uh, for that particular arm. But when they assessed one-year outcomes, it turns out that the 0.5 milligram per kilogram arm had the best one-year outcomes. So this is a dichotomous uh, uh, result that really led to a lot of confusion. 
No, sorry. Yeah, I think I'm uh, going over here. I'm just so passionate about antithrombin therapy. Uh, let me run through this very, very quickly, and uh, I'll skip some of this. ATOL was a uh, IV primary PCI trial with IV and oxaparin. Um, it just missed statistical significance, so I think IV and oxaparin really has not gotten a foothold in the cath lab. So let's talk about bivalirudin versus unfractionated heparin. I'll just spend about two minutes on this. Uh, there have been lots of studies looking at this, um, lots of debates in the prior meetings about this. Uh, this is a meta-analysis done by Matt Cavender, who's now at UNC, looking at all of the randomized trials, looking at major adverse cardiac events, showing that um, in general, when I mean, you pool all the data together, the data actually favor unfractionated heparin, not bivalirudin, which is very surprising. And a lot of this is driven by the fact that there's an increased risk of acute stent thrombosis in the trials comparing bivalirudin with unfractionated heparin. A lot of that is um, within the first 24 hours. The subacute stent thrombosis rate was not different. So that is a price that you pay when you use bivalirudin versus unfractionated heparin. Again, there's a couple of things that affect this. The first is 2B3 inhibitor use. So if you're going to use a 2B3 inhibitor, plan 2B3A, it looks like bivalirudin is safer. Makes sense. You have two anti-thrombotic agents versus one. Um, so, but if you're not going to use a 2B3 inhibitor, it looks like there's no significant difference in terms of bleeding between bivalirudin and unfractionated heparin, and again, with a price to pay of potentially increased acute stent thrombosis. What about uh, access site? Um, this is a, a little bit of a tough nut to crack. We did this meta-analysis as part of an editorial that we wrote showing that it looks like the combination of radial plus bivalirudin may result in the best safety, radial affecting access site and uh, bivalirudin affecting non-access site, although I think that the use of bivalirudin among the radial crowd is actually quite low uh, these days. So let me just summarize this, and I apologize for going over. There are three choices in the cath lab, unfractionated heparin, bivalirudin, and IV enox, which is really not uh, widely used. It's influenced by the choice of antiplatelet therapy and access site. Really, unfractionated heparin, the oldest drug, is still the 800-pound gorilla. Higher doses reduce your ischemic complications and reversibility make it the agent of choice for CTOs. I would say that bivalirudin nowadays in contemporary practice is really reserved for patients who are undergoing femoral access or in very, very large patients where you don't want to keep redosing unfractionated heparin to maintain the therapeutic ACT. Thank you very much. Great, Sunil. That was fabulous. And you've taught us so much about radial access and antithrombotic therapy. That was a great overview.